How great of a thing is it when you can go back in time by having something trigger a memory or you get to meet somebody that uh, from your past? Well, maybe you can have that memory spurned by somebody from the past that you never met before. And I got to do that today. You see, I'm decked out in Steelers gear for this intro. And I get to talk to one of the super Steelers of the 1970s, one of my boyhood icons of watching this team go. And what a great conversation we had. We have Hunter Craig Colquitt, two-time Super Bowl champion, visiting with us to talk about him and his success in the NFL and his two sons, Dustin and Britton, as well as some other family members and a great stories to boot. Craig Colquitt comes up on the pig pen in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And boy, do we have a special night for you tonight. Really special for me because one of my childhood uh, team members of the Pittsburgh Steelers, two-time Super Bowl champion, Craig Colquitt, is with us tonight. Craig, welcome to the Pig Pen. Hey, Darren. Thanks for inviting me. I look forward to talking Pittsburgh and football and enjoying the time. Yeah, you you definitely have a lot of football in in your life and your family's life, and we're going to get into that and uh, you know just some exciting things. So I'm looking forward to this. Now, Me too. now you you had you know you come from one of the the great uh, traditional colleges of football from University of Tennessee, and you really uh, were there at a really special time, and it's got sort of a, a Pittsburgh connection because mm-hmm. I believe uh, Coach Johnny Majors coached. Uh, Pitt when Tony Dorsett and, and others were there and he won national championship. He surprisingly left and you know, surprisingly to us in Western Pennsylvania, probably not so much to folks in Tennessee, goes down to Tennessee and you had the privilege of playing for, for coach majors. What, what was that like when uh, Johnny majors comes in to, to coach the. It, it was a significantly different dynamic. Uh, the coach that was there, Bill battle, not taking anything away from him. He was offensive, defensive minded, and you know, typical kind of coach. Let the somebody else handle the kickers and the punters. And when Mike Majors came in, you know, he was a punter in college, and he loved punting. And then he spent a, a great deal of time with me and the other kickers, uh, kicker punters, uh, during practices to fine tune it. So uh, before he passed, every time I saw him, I said. Uh, you're the reason I got into the NFL. And he'd look at me and say, no, you're the reason you got the NFL. Just very humble guy. Uh, mm-hmm. But in your face, if you're not producing, and that's the way my brain operates anyway. I'm kind of like a – I was a defensive end and a running back, so I was used to hitting. And, you know, the coach had to get in my head, you know, to mm-hmm. get me produced. So he was – majors was like that. And it was called Johnny Comes Marching Home. You know, yeah. they, they – played the song and everything. So it was, it's definitely a great experience. Uh, I, I bet. Now that was a, a interesting time. Cause I can remember you know, watching TV and I, I can't remember if it was a pitter at uh, Tennessee, maybe it was both, but you know, Lee majors uh, was, is a, a relative of his. He's married to Farrah Fawcett. These are, you know, two big stars of the mid seventies, late seventies that, you know, everybody wanted to do probably maybe like uh, Taylor Swift is today being shown on uh, during football games, those college games. And they're, they're showing, you know, the $6 million man and everybody's sweetheart, uh, Farrah Fawcett. Uh, right. how, how was that? Did they ever come to like practices and stuff when you were I don't Tennessee? remember practices, but they were usually on the sideline. You know, they probably flew in the, more of the game and then they would they would be there and of course the everybody's just gawking at them so uh that, that was a really great experience to just to see that you know because fair Fawcett at that time had you know her poster was everywhere you know the the yeah, red might, beta suit <laughs> yeah it might be the most famous poster in, in history i'm sure because it was on a lot of walls yeah. uh, around it was on a lot of walls <laughs> yeah that's God bless sure. yourself, you know. Yeah, that's for sure. That I mean, that's a, just a cool thing. You have this big time coach, you know, big time relatives coming in, and you got you're playing big time football, and you know that had to be 
pretty exciting. Okay, yeah. What what are some of the uh, the biggest games or biggest plays you remember at, when you were at the University of Tennessee that you can share with us? You did. Uh, let me go back and say one thing though. Uh, sure. On the sidelines, I can't remember just three or four times the exact number, but Jimmy Buffett was on the sidelines wearing really? number twenty one, which was uh, Stanley Morgan's number. Majors and uh, are and him or Buffett are really good friends. So when he would play in the, on campus at the Stokely Athletic Center, which would be totally sold out, he'd be there for the game, you know, and then was playing that night. So it's, you know, just to see him standing on the sidelines. I actually remember him more than fairly majors, but that, that was pretty exciting. So probably the, 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 the only way to say the biggest would have been when I played at the Coliseum in Los Angeles, because it was the first time I'd ever been on an airplane and we flew across the country to play out there. And it was a really great game. Uh, 33, 28, uh, we lost, but um, that kind of introduced me how big college is, even though, you know, I'm punting in front of 78,000 people. You know, you go to the Coliseum, it's in Los Angeles, in the center of, you know, the media world. And so that's very exciting to me. But it was my first plane ride. Jim. Wow. Huh. Very, very cool. I'm still trying to get over, uh, you know, having having parrot heads, a $6 million man, uh, you know, coach majors, and, uh, you know, everybody's, uh, you know, pinup uh, poster all on the sideline and uh, how, how you played a football game. That's uh... <laughs> well, there's one thing about majors. He's a politician. He, he should have run, you know, gone into politics because he knows how to play things up, you know, and even make it more exciting than it actually is. So he was big about promotion and, you know, staying out of the papers, you know, stay, you know, mind your manners, be polite, you know, visit the hospitals. So, uh, just a really a great leader for a lot of a lot of players, and I'm sure the same impact in in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, before you go in the NFL. Okay, so you you, you had an idea that that probably some teams were interested. Did, did anybody uh, talk to you? Or I mean, it's not like it is today where everybody knows everybody's business, and you know you have 20 channels telling you everything that's going to go on and predicting. Yeah. Uh, did, did you have any inkling that uh, you would be drafted? Uh, not – well, two weeks before the draft, yeah. That would, and I'll tell you that, that whole story, but my team was the Dallas Cowboys. And I was getting a letter from Gil Brandt every week my entire senior <laughs> year. I mean, as soon as my senior year started, every week I was getting a letter. So I knew I was going to be a Cowboy. And the day before the draft, they said, we're going to take you in the fifth round. And Pittsburgh took me in the third. And I was disappointed, actually, until I found out, you know, then I looked at the, the roster and, you know, it's a who's who's roster. Hmm. Uh, but uh, Chuck No tried me out two weeks earlier at Neyland Stadium. He flew to Knoxville with three other coaches and No actually snapped the ball to me. And I had a terrible tryout. I was so nervous. Hmm. And I don't know if you remember this name, Dick Haley. Mm -hmm. the yeah. Well, Dick worked me out probably about a month before the draft, and I was hitting howitzers, accurate, boom. And it was just who Dick was. You know, he could – I could perform in front of him, but here comes Chuck. You know, and it was it was really uh, a tough situation for me. But what – got to tell a quick story on that. My coach was George Caffigo, and George Caffigo uh, – when I do speeches I sh or talks, I show a picture of him. He was All-American and All-Pro at the Chicago Bears and I think St. Louis Cardinals. But he played three years in the NFL, but he was All-American at the University of Tennessee in 38, 37, 38, 39 was his era. But he was my direct coach, so he's probably about 60, 64 years of age at that time. Um, and it's coming up the draft, and, and I got word that I needed to go pick up Chuck Knoll and the coaches at a local airport. And I said, I'm, sure, I'll go get them. Yeah, I'll, I'll get it. I don't know, know how to react. Uh, they, they, was, had, they had you drive to the airport and pick up the coaches? Yes, yeah, wow. they wanted me to pick them up. <laughs> you know, so uh, 
I don't know if there was some kind of recruiting thing. It couldn't be because I've already finished with my career. But I, I went uh, to George Caffigo's office and I asked Coach Caffigo if I could borrow his car. And he said, why you want to borrow my car? And I says, well, I'm picking up Chuck. No, he says, yeah, I know about that. And I said, well, I will pick him up in your car. And he says, why is that? I said, because my car is a 1967 Chevrolet Bel Air four-door rust out hood, rusted out trunk. And I, you know, I want to, you know, pizzazz a little. And they said, and I was called JC while I was in college. He said, JC, pick them up in your car. They'll see how bad you need money and you'll make a lot more money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so was, George Caffigo was just, uh, he came up with all kinds of things that just could whittle away the anxiousness of, of a game situation. And I think it for him being a player and have been in the pros, even that way back, it was, he was just one of, one of those guys that was able to level, you know, that the adrenaline flow that's really bad for kickers and punters. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Great story. Now, okay. Now you said that coach majors was uh pretty personable. He, you know, should have been like a politician, but you know, when he had to get staunch, he got staunch with you and coach Noel. I mean, he comes off of, he was very, seemed very stoic, uh, you know, no, no, uh, messing around You're straight to business. Is, is that how, how coach Noel was, uh, during that tryout and during your years playing with him? Trying to think of all the names he was called, Emperor, God, Chuck. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think, you know, now looking back, the difficulty of being a coach with players that are at that level, knowing that their careers are over after this and they're young men still, uh, that's a tough job. And, you know, back then it was still Yale spit cuss football you know now it's kind of psychological approach i guess now for some of them uh, but yeah he was uh kind of hard to reach but he would get personal every now and then i mean it, it was his decision when though, that makes sense yeah it's, i've heard some some other players talk about him and you know what, what we would see on tv and and uh you know with announcers and the talking heads would tell us i you know, there's other sides that uh, you as players had and uh, everybody has sort of a warm spot in their heart for him, but they also had those times where, you know, he, he got chewed out by him. You know, so it's, uh, yeah. it's well, I, I punted the football for Chuck. No. And then the team. And if that makes sense, I yeah. mean, if the coaches, the head coach is always like, kind of like that doc dad figure, you know, especially mm -hmm. the way he handled himself. So you know, I wanted to punt for him. So it was, that's the way I thought. You know, if I was effective for the team, great. But it, I had to look at Chuck to know if I did all right. If he's looking at me, I screwed up and I knew it already anyway. But if he's not looking at me, I did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that uh, coming back, at, you know, after a good punt was a great thing. But maybe after you had one that wasn't maybe your, your best uh, performance, Probably wasn't a, a pleasant trip back to the sideline, I'm sure. <laughs> I on, on a particular punt, I won't use the words, but I was can I use this in my talks and I clean it up in there. We're kicking to the right. Okay. We yeah. always kick left to right. And when I hit the ball, obviously it was starting to curve. And Billy White Shoes Johnson is the punt returner. It's the Atlanta Falcons. Oh. And he he's a first four three guy, you know. And uh, a recorded guy, I think, in the NFL. Well, he caught it full stride on the other numbers. I mean, it just came from the numbers on the right side all the way over. It's that bad of a curve. Full speed, caught it. Fortunately, it was tackled in front of me. And uh, he hit the ground, and I got hit, you know, all this stuff. But when I ran off the field, Chuck is standing. I'm on the far end of the sidelines. Chuck doesn't come down there. I, I go to the sidelines and I turn around. He is in my face. He says, which way were you kicking the ball? I said, to the right. He said, which way did the ball go? I said, to the left. And he just lost it. <laughs> 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 well, kick the ball. Where were you? Know? And I said, yes, sir. Chuck, yes. <laughs> now, I think that was my rookie year. 
But even then, when I when he left and I went back to the sidelines, I felt better about myself because I knew how important that part of the game is. So it just it, it ignited my career, if I could say so. Never had that yell at him again like that. So, yeah, so it was a a moment that uh, gave you some inspiration to to, to want right. to achieve, achieve higher. That's great, great. Yeah, and I was a, I was I pretty much respected my father more fear than anything. So that's the way my brain worked. <laughs> Now you're saying, and you know, I see back in the the records, you know, you were drafted in the third round of the NFL draft. Now, now by today's standards, you, I don't really know that the punters are drafted. Maybe one or two punters a, a year are drafted, if that, and never that high. Was is that pretty unprecedented for for a punter to get drafted that high? It was, and I and there was a lot of articles in the paper about spending that money in that direction. But the year before, and I've never verified this account, uh, but Bobby Walden is the punter mm-hmm. at, at Pittsburgh. And the year before, he had seven punts blocked for touchdowns. Mm-hmm. Now, I need to verify that. But when I saw the film of him, um, I was going, I don't know how they did. Why didn't they just go ahead and tackle him? Because he was a very deliberate three-step punter, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, But – I don't know if I can verify that, but seven punts blocked for touchdowns stuck in my mind. So he had to go as far yeah. as, you know, because they were probably losing those games or, you know, they were probably pretty close. And that was the 77 season when Walden was still the punter. But uh, it's funny, I met him too. He's a Georgia boy, so very Southern. Okay. And uh, he came he came to a practice. Uh, I want to say it was at the stadium. Uh, feels like it was at the stadium. Never met him. Never saw him face to face. Somebody took me over there and wanted to introduce me. So anyway, Bobby Walden is, I hit the pile, is pretty much at the middle of the field. And I walked over there and introduced myself. And yet the first thing out of his mouth was, boy, you need to eat some cornbread and beans. You're too skinny. <laughs> like that, <laughs> and and Bobby's kind of built like a linebacker, you know. So yeah, he was a big he was, guy. He he's right. I was 178 pounds, so I was skinny. Dustin and Britton are both over 200 pounds when they were playing. So I, you know, I was a six almost six two, but 178 pounds. <laughs> wow. Now, how was that? Okay, you when you're you're drafted in the third round, you know, there's. You you have a little bit of controversy, like you said, or, or maybe the media's you know on the case of the Steelers, but they they sort of knew what they wanted, and they really didn't have too many holes to fill on the roster. I mean, it's a a Hall of Fame roster at that point. They won yeah, two Super Bowls, yeah, two yeah. Super Bowl rings just in the last few years before you got there, and uh, they're, they're pretty stacked on both sides. And you know you have to walk in that locker room for the first time and look at these these guys that have been you know winning rings and going to pro bowls and all pros and, you know, eventual hall of famers. How was that walk walking into that locker room for the first time? You know, I was really kind of amazed how polite the guys were, you know, cause I, I had several guys come up to me and the one that stands out in my mind was Joe green, you know, welcome to Pittsburgh. We need a punter, you know? So it was, uh, took a lot of the edge off of it. I could sort of act my country, Knox, South Knoxville self, you know, felt mm-hmm. at home. Um, but there, I didn't feel the controversy, actually. It was, uh, it was kind of a red carpet treatment all the way around. And everybody's just so professional. I think that just as controversial as it would be that Chuck would be called the emperor, it's, it's really you saw what happened from this type of, of – thinking and an approach to the game. So everybody was going, this guy knows how to win, you know, so let's, let's go for it. Yeah. So it was, it was very comforting, uh, I guess is a good word uh, in my transition, even though I'd never been to Pittsburgh. So it was a big change. Yeah. That's uh, kind of ironic that the first guy to <laughs> greet you at your member is uh, known by the first name of mean uh, to most of us. Yeah. There's so, so furthest <laughs> thing me. I mean, literally, he and Jack Lambert and some of the guys that are notorious, they, it was a switch. 
some of the best actors I've met. Like, uh, you know, when it was game time, different personality. <laughs> that's, that's good to hear because they, yeah. they were, they were heroes to, to most of us kids, you know, the, in the seventies uh, from Western Pennsylvania. So that's great to hear when your heroes are like that. Now you, I went back and I was watching some, some footage huh. that's on YouTube of you. And I, you know, of course, I, I was a 12 year old kid in 1979. So I'm at the height of, you know, you, you guys in black and gold are, and you guys could do no wrong. And it was a great time to be in Western Pennsylvania. And I never realized what a game you had in a 1979 AFC championship game. Um, I mean, folks, listen to these stats. It's the second biggest game you had that year against your rival, the, the Houston Oilers. And they had a pretty good team that year. And you had three punts and had 153 yards of punting. You averaged 51 yards of punt in a humongous game. And two of them that are on YouTube that I watched were in the third quarter where one year standing at the 10 yard line, you had a 66 yard punt, uh, which was amazing. The other one you're in your, in your own end zone, kicking out of it and you got it over midfield uh, and you know, the Oilers they, and the Oilers didn't score on either one of those drives. I don't believe either. Now that is just amazing. And it was a 17 to 10 game Steelers are up by a touchdown at that point uh, for a game where the winner goes to the Super Bowl. You know, that that's a gamer, my friend. You were you were up for that. Well, I, I appreciate the memories. It was it, it's so clear in my mind that game because the whole week it was rain and ice, and literally the field was saturated. You know, I was wet. My feet were wet. So, but got to do it. You know, you got to hit the ball. So, uh, but I tell you the, I appreciate you were saying. I don't I have the the least ego you ever meet. But I got to tell you two stories that made the difference in how I was kicking in the playoff, especially against Houston. When we first played our first game in Houston, I'm finished with pregame warm-up. I'm standing in the middle of the field and talking with Roy Jarella, the, you know, just hobnobbing and uh, God forget the punter. I'll think of it in a minute. But I had somebody punch me in the back and I turned around. It was an Earl Campbell. And he said, welcome to the NFL, Colquitt. Enjoyed being drafted with you. You know, he was first <laughs> round pick. I was third round pick at Pittsburgh that same year. So Earl Campbell. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going, wow. I mean, just everything's starting to mellow out. I mean, it just that just that transition because the Houston and Pittsburgh, that's a dog fight. Just like going oh, to Cleveland, yeah. Cincinnati, it was a dog fight. So Another story, and in that game against Houston, in that playoff game, it's nasty. Like I'm saying, it's hard to keep the balls dry. And I get a ball snapped to me, and I'm seeing a blue object get closer and closer to me, but I'm focused. I hit the ball, and I look up, and it's Bumfield's big old hat, boots, <laughs> you know, the, that era, that, that get up. And he said, Boy, not only is Mother Nature against you, but you can't get this big, fat guy out of your way. And he was talking about himself, you know, <laughs> but he used, he used the F-bomb, this big <laughs> guy out of the way. And it was like my feet warmed up, my hands warmed up. I totally relaxed in, in that game and because Earl Campbell in the beginning, you know, in the beginning of the year and then Bum Phillips, I guess maybe they were interested in me. I don't know why he came out to me, but he did. And that was just relaxed me for the whole game. You know, it, I think it's an amazing moment on the YouTube clip. You, when you hit the 66 yarder and the first one to come and hug you that they show Donnie shell, Hall of famer a few years ago comes up, gives you a big hug. And that defense played amazing. I mean, Earl Campbell, had 15 yards on 17 carries. That's his stat sheet for the game. I mean, that, yeah. that, that that's a big man to, to stop. So th those guys uh, really appreciated you, you getting it out. Uh, so, you know, get it on the other side of the field so that they had some room it, to work. It, it That game reflected home field advantage in Pittsburgh in inclement weather like that. I mean, it looked like Houston did not want to be there. I think in that game, if I memory serves with right, Bradshaw ran with the ball and did a slide, and he slid like eleven yards before he made. 
<laughs> you know, so, but it was that it was that wet. Then you know, and that was in our favor, but we were there to win. I mean, it was it was up to us to make the decision. The big thing is Pittsburgh had already been there twice. You know, they knew how this was going. So I felt that same kind of energy from them. We could do this. Yeah. Um, now how, okay. That the punt that you had for 46 yards where you're standing in your own end zone. So seven point game, you, you said the weather's kind of inclement, the ball's wet, the fields, you know, it's that Astro turf, not the greatest thing to be standing on. And you've got, you know, 60 some thousand fans going nuts and you're on national television. Everybody in the country's watching you. I mean, what is it like, you got to be puckered up a little bit uh, before you get to that snap. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Your... Yeah. Memory is, you know, the way the games are and the way the performing is, you know, you're an athlete. When something happens really well, you can't recall what you did. But what you did was everything right. You know, you, you got your thinking conscious brain out of the way and your subconscious is just taking over. It's what I teach my kickers. I said, you know, muscle memory is amazing. So I, I think I was just in the zone. And trust me, when I saw that Dottie Shell hug on YouTube, it came back to me because I can mm -hmm. see the ball bouncing out there. And it, it did hyperplay a little bit on that water. So I, I had yeah. to help. <laughs> That's a, a great <laughs> moment. Okay, so you guys ended up winning that game. Uh, I think it was like 27 to 13 you when – you go into the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 13, one of the greatest Super Bowls ever played, against the team that you just told us earlier was your favorite team growing up. You're playing right. the Dallas Cowboys and Tom Landry and Roger Staubach and Tony Dorsett. You know, how, how, what were your feelings uh, going into that week, you know, knowing that, you know, what a, first of all, it's a big game and going against uh, a team that you idolized uh, when you were younger? You know, my mind was, give me the ball. I want to run with it. You know, I want to beat them too. You know, uh, it, it was not you messed me up kind of attitude. It was now it was competitive. You know, I was kicking against Danny White. I wanted to outperform Danny White. You know, I wanted to to perform for Chuck Noll and for, uh, you know, I had a big family, a lot of family there. Um, and that was a great experience. I was able to pay for their flights, hotel, meals. It was a little extra cash, you know, Super Bowl tickets. Right. But, uh, yeah, playing against Dallas, Roger Staubach, who, you know, I, my thing was that's where I'm headed, you know, and Danny White would be able to step over and just back, be a backup quarterback, not have to worry about punting anymore. That's how I was already thinking. And, but, you know, it changed and it, it was to my benefit. So, and I actually watched the highlights of Super Bowl 13 the other day for the first time in, I don't know, 30, 40 years. I, I watched those. And I forgot how clear digitalized uh, games are now. You know, you can see people's eyelashes. And, you know, I think, man, that's that's ancient looking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the kind of an interesting thing, a little twist here. Now, you've been coaching. I mean, you have you have two sons, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that have punted. You have an, an NFL a nephew that's punted in the NFL. You know, the Cole Quit name is, you know, it's in a dictionary, uh, punting NFL Cole Quit is probably the first word in in Webster's. But if you when you go back and watch this footage of yourself, you know, almost 40 years ago, or almost 50 years ago, now over 40 years ago, and you watch yourself punt, you know, what what would you say to a young Craig Cole Quit, you know, uh, in those NFL games? What, what did you like about, the style, uh, what do you, what would you do, you know, suggest maybe differently? I would have, I would say to him, eat some cornbread and beans, boy, and put on some muscle. <laughs> the old Bobby <laughs> Walton statement. I do, huh? I, do look, I, I do look skinny out there. So, uh, but the, you know, the beauty of that, when that came out on YouTube, somebody sent that to me and uh, I looked at it. I said, Dustin and Britain have never seen this. And I shipped that to them immediately. And it kind of invigorated me to uh, take a reel to reel, I guess you call them, the, the mm -hmm. old reel, uh, nine millimeter, I guess is what they are. I think it, what it was. Yeah. I've had all these years and I took it to a guy that could digitalize it. And all it is is me practicing putting. I've never seen that. It's been within the past year and a half, two years. Really? And, 
And I sent it to Dustin and Brent, and I said, look at this stud. Because, you know, <laughs> I, only, I only did two steps. Absolutely, it was two steps. And Dustin and Brent were two steps, but they added a little jab step to give, they thought, give them a little more power. And uh, they never quite grasped. And what I try to teach is you, what you have to grasp is the powers in your leg. You know, the drop is everything, but the power comes from that impact against the ball. And if you're thick, that's it's going to be more powerful. And Dustin and Britton could hit plus five fives, you know, at times. So hmm. uh, that kind of panned out to be true. But when I saw me doing it when I was a young guy with a, a, a you know a nice black looking beard and you know <laughs> out there going full head of blonde hair, but it was in black and white. I, I thought you know this is really good to pass this down through the ages. Because uh, nobody had seen it, I hadn't even seen. It. Yeah, you can go back and say, "Hey, I'm I'm not just telling you fellows this. So I I, I lived it. This is uh this is the way you do it. <laughs> so you get here. Phone. It is. Yeah. Learn. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just I, it's interesting. I a, a place kicker punter I work with in the area where I live. He just signed with Center College uh, outside of Lexington. You know, full scholarship, and nice. that's really rewarding. Uh, when I'm able to do that, because, you know, that's $40,000 a year, the parents are saving. I don't even charge. Now I'm going to change that because, <laughs> you know, I used to joke and say, I want 10% of your savings, you know, and, and that'd be $160,000 or, you know, $16,000. But uh, it, it worked. I mean, it's, it, I love the coach. So, looking at those videos and then showing that to them, it's just more uh, fodder, if you will, to, you know, promote what we've done and promote our past, like you're doing for me on this podcast. Yeah. Now, now going into a little bit, you know, you, I'm sure, sure you, you taught your sons the, the right way. And that's why, you know, you're probably a, a key to part of their success of making in the NFL. They each have a Super Bowl ring and I'm sure you were probably at the, those venues when they were playing. Oh yeah. And so what, what was the bigger moment for you winning a Super Bowl yourself with the Steelers or, you know, watching Dustin win with Kansas city a few years ago or, or Britain win with uh, Denver, you know, over, you know, almost 15 years ago now, what, what, what was uh, the, the bigger feeling for you? Definitely they're winning the Super Bowls because uh, it was, it's difficult to kind of conceive of what has happened. You know, me, my nephew, Jimmy, or Dustin in Britain. But for them to have that experience in a, a job that they really enjoy doing, that's the best there is. You know, it's basically what that amount, what it amounts to was hugely thrilling. I was nervous and anxious their entire careers. You know, one of these days I want to interview, um, uh, Archie Manning and say, what did you feel like every time they went out on the field? Because, you know, he's his kids are getting nailed, you know, all the time. And, you know, yeah. how did you feel? And just now in the past couple of years since they're not playing, I'm starting to enjoy football again. And I'm watching it all the time. I mean, I, I need to know more about football to be a critic. Uh, but – that's how it's kind of changed for me now that they're gone. I'm asking your question in a broad way, but definitely for them to have that same success is really hard to describe. Yeah, I'll bet. I figured that was probably going to be your answer. I mean, I just sit there and I think about between you and your sons, you played with some amazing quarterbacks, you know, a lot of amazing players, but you sit there and think about, it, you know, Terry Bradshaw with yourself and Dustin you know, playing with Patrick Mahomes, who's probably, you know, probably going to be a first ballot hall of famer when he's all said and done Peyton Manning, uh, with Britain, uh, just, uh, some amazing, uh, folks that, uh, you guys got to be side by side with. That's, that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. It's kind of like somebody sat me down 20 years ago, 30 years ago and said, this is going to happen in the future. I go, no, uh, that's, that's crazy. You can't make that stuff up, <laughs> but that's the way it worked out. And, uh, I don't know if I said this, uh, to y'all before the other podcast, but I had a reporter call me in Super Bowl 54 
for an interview and we're talking and he said, have you thought about the uh, odds of what's about to happen if your son wins the football game? And I said, no, I mean, he says, well, you haven't put it in perspective. And in reality, I haven't because I was really pretty anxious, you know, nervous. I didn't want to think a whole lot of it, just join the family and the festivities and everything. And he says, well, you can't put it to numbers. You can't go point zero 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 odds of this happening. He said, so I made it funny. He said, the odds of this happening are, <clears throat> are like you being bit by a shark, hit by a car, and struck by lightning all in the same hour. hour. <laughs> and I went, that is a that is the odds against that, isn't it? You know, yeah, it, but, but it you're is right. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, and I think so. I mentioned that the other night in a podcast that, that we were on the group podcast. They said, "Have you thought about this? Been with these quarterbacks that are all going to be Hall of Famers?" And I said, "No, but that's chapter fifteen in the book. I mean, that's I really haven't thought about it. But it's almost yeah. common sense. But no, I mean, it's it's amazing." Yeah, somewhere out there, there's a parents of uh, you know up and aspiring punters in high school. They're probably going to be wondering, you know, what kind of a uh, drink are you serving at the uh, Colquitt family reunions when you have four of you that made the NFL and uh, you know four Super Bowl rings uh, in that family? That's that's I mean that just blows me away. That's uh, quite a testament to to you and and your family uh, for what you you do. That's that's pretty pretty interesting. It's, it's a blessing <clears throat> and. <clears throat> and it, it's a blessing and what we haven't done is all three of us get together and hold out our rings and take a picture i've done it you know with them separately but we haven't done it with a group now i've done it with britain i don't think i've done it with dustin we don't have that picture of all of us together dustin been in kansas city britain's oh. in florida you know and i go there or, you know and then you gotta do it you gotta, gotta do it. it that'd be that'd be a cool picture definitely yeah all right. Now, now, I guess a little bit of um, on the other side of, of the, your profession, you know, being, being a punter here. Now, we, you know, often see where punters, where defenders coming in and they might miss the punter, but the punter puts on that, you know, the, the announcers like, oh, look at, you know, that was a great acting job. He's going to get an Emmy for that. Did, did you work on, on that as a punter, to, you know, to try to get that call? No, you know, and, and I don't mean this braggadociously. If somebody was close, that close, uh, I was running with them all. And I'd run outside and kick it because uh, uh, my focus is kind of hyper focus, if you will, because I didn't get a putt blocked the whole time I was with Pittsburgh. I didn't get a putt blocked in really? college. Wow. Yeah, the only putt I got blocked was against Baltimore, and I was only there for a week, you know, but uh, – I could see the people coming in and I'm only taking two steps and we lined up, you know, on the 13 yard line, 13 yards back. So the ball is gone when I got 11 yards from the snap. So uh, now I'd had people that ran past me, but instinctively I'm, I could adjust if that makes sense. Yeah, so, you were, so, so maybe you were uh, popularizing the, the rugby punt. Uh, on, on fourth down uh, before it was popular. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's another thing of Johnny Majors. He called it a quick kick, and it was you go, you turn sideways and kick it. And it's the soccer, it's like a goalie kicking the ball. You just, right. you know, you just turn the ball down like it's a field goal and you kick it like it's a, a field goal off the ground. But it's, you know, it's elevated, of course. And if you're good at it, it can be very effective. As it's, you see all these Aussie players. You know, in the NFL and college now. Yeah, it, it was quite the the fat. I, I was a high school official for twenty seven oh, years here in Pennsylvania, and uh, I know it was really popular. Probably about twenty years ago, it seemed like everybody was was doing it. You know, you didn't have the traditional you know two step or three step like you did. You're running one way or the other and and giving her a, a boot down the field. So, did you? Uh, and I apologize for not uh, remembering this. Were you the holder on uh, on kicks for points with the Steelers? Next point. Go goats. Yeah. 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 And it was Chuck's. They said, You're going to be holding here. And I said, I've never held before. But they said, Well, you're going to be holding here. You know, you, we spend so much time together. It only makes sense. And, and you know, why would you want to get a backup quarterback injury? So, right. You know, I was, I was fine with it. It got me to, you know, I was able to participate in a game that much more, you know, and, and you know, I was close to the kickers. Okay. Now, did you have the same uh, long snapper? 
or, or they didn't have like specialist long snappers and did they or was it was it webster snapping to you mark webster and ray penny really yeah yeah, wow. yeah. it's i got a story about mac webster too that this is all going to be in the book i've got to do when i do speaking engagements i go into these but uh mike webster is a perfectionist and he could throw a bullet and we're playing in Los Angeles at the Coliseum, and it had been a torrential rain, so the field was a mess. And uh, he always asked me, how was the snap? How was the snap? And I never told him I had a bad snap. I said, Webby, I'm sticking my hand straight out, and here's a circle. If you can get it in this circle, I'm happy. <laughs> and so, you know, that opened up a can of words because it was, you know, going this and that, but I never – critiqued his snap until this one game. <laughs> it's so funny. God bless his soul. He's such a great, great. guy. Uh, he's in this game, he snapped a bad snap to me. It was, you know, ex absolutely not where I want to have to go to get a ball because I got to come back inside. And he, I got him on the sidelines and he comes over and asks me, how was the snap? This is the first time I ever said it. I said, Webby, it was way over here and I kind of need to get it over here. And he says, well, why don't you get somebody else to snap the ball to you? And he turned around and left. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I never complained again because I <laughs> sort of knew what was coming. Uh, but, you know, I, I was thrilled to be behind Mike Webster. You know, here's Mike Webster snapping the ball. So I never complained again. Yeah, I'll, I'll but I had the, the pleasure. I got a chance to meet uh, John Kolb this past summer, and he had some great stories of, of Mike Webster. And I listened uh, quite a bit on radio. You know, uh, the late Tunch Oaken and Craig Wolfley were you know just youngsters coming in when when those guys were going out, and, you, and you, yourself coming out. And they always had some fond stories to tell about you know Mike Webster too, and and all of you. So that's a uh, that's good to hear. I, I like I said when. I get to to talk to you folks and hear stories about you and hear the good side of you know what happened in the huddles and the sidelines and see what good people you are. Uh, now that just makes me feel great to to be a Steelers fan in the seventies and you know my my heroes in in those uh, black and gold helmets were, were real heroes and real real good people and that's that's always great to hear and I uh, I appreciate that and appreciate you for doing that uh, you know being the good people you are. Now, Craig, do you have any, uh, what do you, besides coaching, uh, you know, what, what other involvement do you have in football? Well, I've ra raising two boys that played in the NFL, but, uh, you know, you sounds like you're helping some other folks out to, in the punting game. Yeah. And from now, every now and then I'll get a call from somebody. If I come over and take a look at a kicker and, and if, if I like the personality or if it's a personality that I, uh, want to deal with, um, uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, you know, I'm sort of semi-retired. Uh, I was in business for 20 years with some guys and uh, we were in the cleaning business. And I was uh, executive salesman and traveled really middle Western United States and all over the South. In fact, my car that I still have, 210, has 410,000 miles on it. Because uh, I lived in the car, lived in the plane, lived in the hotel. It, it's not that 68 Bel Air still, is it? No, it's it, it, like, it, but it's in the. Now I've lost the question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll I'll do that. I got, I'll go off on these tangents. No, what, just, what, just, tangent. just asking you know what your involvement in football is, uh, you know, currently yeah. And, and. Yeah, I get the opportunity to go over at Tennessee and watch Dustin, uh, coach, and you know the biggest thrill that has occurred is Dustin absolutely loves coaching and he is really good at it. I mean, it's just, can these guys are putty in his hands. You know, they want to listen. They're respectful to him. And Britain's the exact same way. I mean, Britain was, came to my kicking camp that I had for 13 years. I used him as an example because he's this natural athlete. And, you know, that's a whole nother story. Dustin never punted a football until two weeks before his senior year started in high school. Really? And he was a he was being recruited all over the country because he was a left footed striker in soccer. And he runs a four or five and he was one hundred and eighty pounds. And that's big in, in soccer. Right. And when he kicked the football, it was it was I, I hated to watch the goalies try to 
fail it. I mean, it's coming so hard. Uh, but he never uh, spent any time with punting. Wasn't interested in it. Britain, natural athlete. Britain, first time he ever played golf, shot an 82. Just natural. Jeez. It's like my, <laughs> my dad was like that. So I used him as an example. So to answer your question, really – Punting and place kicking is so important to the game that I like to get into the, the psychological aspect of it, a routine, and develop the kids far beyond what they anticipate. You know, they're just looking at somebody catching the ball and kicking it. Well, I want to take it to the level that this is incredibly financially beneficial to you or I don't want to spend time with you. I want this to be what you want to do to get you either a great education or take you there as long as it, it can take you. So that's a, I feel like it's a gift and a blessing that I can pull out of a kid, you know, that inner self, you know, that desire to, to do it. Cause I tell them you can do this, you know, especially after I've watched them a bit, you know, I won't shoot the bull with somebody. I've had one person, in fact, I'm working with now, his parents met, had me meet him at seven or eight years of age and wanted me to work with him. And I said, you know, I'll, I'll spend the time with him. He's kicking a Nerf ball, you know. Hmm. And he was so methodical. This kid's straight A student today. I mean, it, everything I told him, he had it imprinted in his brain. And his name is Wilson Boyd. His dad's a state representative here in Tennessee. And if you come to a practice, it'll blow your mind how – Everything is precise. And that little boy now is Wilson's probably 5'10", 5'11", I guess. And he's going to be taking over the kicking at the high school where I worked with the other kid that just signed the center college. Mm -hmm. So that's a long drawn out answer. It said, this is enough. I wouldn't want to coach quarterbacks or, you know, that any other position. This is enough. Well, your your track record speaks for itself when you have uh you know folks wearing rings uh you know with a Super Bowl champion on on the side of them and guys playing in the NFL making a living at doing that. Uh, so great job uh you know I really appreciate you you coming on here and and sharing with us you know sharing your, your college days uh your, your your days with the Steelers your days uh you know with your, your boys and enjoying their Super Bowl wins and their, their great accomplishments that they've had in the NFL. And, you know, with these youngsters out there, it's a, it's a privilege to, to get to talk to you, Craig, and really appreciate you coming on. Uh, Darren, I appreciate it too. And look forward to putting more history together. We can talk again sometime. Absolutely. <laughs> That's all the football history we have today, folks. Join us back tomorrow for more of your football history. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com.